So have a seat, relax, nice little breather on a Friday afternoon. We're learning, learning about the kidney. We are doing the overall anatomy, the gross anatomy to start, some internal features. And we're really gonna dive in to the physiology next week. So the mechanisms underpinning some of the phenomena that you observed in lab this week with all of the uh, drinking and peeing on command, micturating on command. We'll learn that scientific word in this section. So kidney function, we are looking to, today we're just gonna review the organization of the external uh, organ and some of the internal features. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the overall large gross anatomy, but I wanna prepare you really for point three. I want you to have a really good grasp by the end of the section on um, fluid and blood flow. What gets filtered, where it gets filtered, and the three major mechanisms of urine excretion. Three major physiological mechanisms uh, that are filtration, reabsorption, and secretion in the nephron. I might take the time to um, we're going to jump into an example, a whole body example that looks at how the kidneys help to uh, regulate pH and pressure and uh, some different ion concentrations after we get all of the ingredients done in this section. And we'll pull that together in point number four. That reminded me, I, I thought halfway through, I, I was reminded just briefly, I want to make just a quick mention. It has nothing to do with the content, so I don't need to record this, but I'm still going to. Make sure when you're uh, finishing your midterms or your lab exams and you've got your Scantron sheets and your booklets, and there are two versions, which there always are in our class, to put your completed tests in the correct pile. Just make sure for the final exam that you put your correct tests or your tests in the correct pile. There's an instance where one test was not in the correct pile and it was marked according to the wrong marking key. Wildly divergent mark. So make sure that doesn't happen. I went through and looked and verified all the other midterm twos are in the appropriate piles that were marked correctly for better or for worse. Make sure that you put your tests in the appropriate piles. Those big printed out letters are there for a reason, okay? Thank you. What else? Did I have another announcement? No, I don't think I did. Oh, I did, yeah. Slide set for the digestive system. I updated and posted the new set to Moodle. So I added a few slides uh, as we went through last week. Those new slides are in the slide set on Moodle. And I only bring that up because I'm gonna do the same thing here. There's a lot of information in this set and I'm probably gonna change a few slides. So I'll wait until this set is done and then upload those again. So those are on Moodle, let's get going. This isn't the first time that we've talked about the function of the kidneys affecting whole body homeostasis. Way back at the beginning of, uh, beginning of this semester, we had spent a lot of time talking about blood pressure. And this slide I took straight from those slides to remind you we've already addressed the idea that the endocrine system or hormones that are produced from some other region of the body can accentuate the control of blood pressure. And some of these hormones, maybe we've seen before or heard mentioned of in lab. And we'll certainly come back to these hormones when we get through the major description of these structures over the next couple, uh, couple days. But uh, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, um, changing and increasing blood volume are all, or it's a cascade of signals that in large part is initiated at the kidneys. It requires a systemic orchestrated response. The lungs are involved, the heart is involved, the liver is involved, but it's largely initiated at the kidneys. So the kidneys are, those, are, are that endocrine organ that can help regulate blood pressure. And this 
like we alluded to six or seven sections ago, is a long-term, more chronic, sustained regulation of blood pressure to complement nervous regulation. I mean, the nervous system can constrict arterioles immediately or relax them immediately and affect blood pressure immediately. This method, much more prolonged and drawn up and sustained, it's longer term regulation that in large part is due to the actions of the kidneys. It's a good thing that I prefaced the fact that I've add slides into the slide set on Moodle. I actually didn't want you to, to frantically copy this down. You already have this in your notes. Just look back a couple of uh, slide sets. It's already there. It's not anything that you've missed. It should be somewhat familiar, but I'm bringing it up because we're going to go into depth on these later. So let's start with just a brief overview video, and I, I apologize if this is a little bit choppy. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. The structures of the urinary system function to filter blood and remove waste from the body. The kidneys are the blood filtering organs. Blood enters the kidneys through the <coughs> urinary arteries. Within the kidneys, substances are filtered out of the blood into urinary structures. Some substances are then reabsorbed back into the blood, and others are secreted into the urine. This three-step process cleans blood and creates the waste product, urine. Urine exits the kidneys and moves down the ureters to the bladder. As the bladder fills, interactions with the brain and nerves contract and relax muscular structures, and urine is pushed out through the urethra in a process called micturition. Not too bad. No new information. This is an overview, but the the uh, exploration of the, of the 3D model, I think, is a really nice uh, element to add. The calyces, I thought, were really cool to see in 3D. We always see when you slice through the kidney, um, we'll look at it eventually, but you don't imagine them in 3D. We saw them here in 3D just briefly. That was a screenshot uh, or a screen grab from my iPad because the, uh, the app that I got doesn't allow me to transfer the movies over, so I just did an analog copy and paste or, or screen recording. But no new information here. We know the major organs of the, of the urinary system in producing urine. The kidneys are the workhorses. They do a lot of the heavy lifting. And the other structures are storage or passage of waste products. So the kidneys are the major workhorses in this area. And the job of the urinary system is to excrete wastes or excrete things that we have an excess of to help maintain balance. Nothing too surprising. The general arrangement you can see shown here, kidneys, um, lateral of the uh, inferior vena cava and the aorta, retroperitoneal at the level of the superior mesenteric artery where, where it branches off. And you remember that from our exercises on the arterial circulation. But, um, Kidneys connected to the ureters, the bladder storing urine until it's expelled through the urethra. Nothing groundbreaking. We can break down some of the individual functions of the kidneys, being that they do most of the work in the section. There's an exhaustive list. I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through these. You already know that somehow ions are are regulated, they're either excreted or conserved. pH can be regulated. Protons can be excreted or conserved. Bicarbonate can be excreted or conserved. Through the movement of those ions, water will move or not move. It will be excreted or it will be absorbed. All told, the ultimate effect will culminate in changing blood volume. Kidneys will regulate the constituents in blood, so the composition of the fluids in the body and the amount of fluid in the body, so regulating blood pressure long term. That, um, that idea of constituents in the fluids or components in the fluid 
can be assessed with the measurement of osmolarity. We can measure sodium concentration, or we can measure chloride concentration, or the amount of urea in the urine. All of those things together, the total solutes in a fluid is describing osmolarity. The total amount of uh, solutes or substances in a fluid is osmolarity. So that just describes all of the ions, all of the minerals, all of the metabolites, maintaining the total concentration of tissues in the body. And there are some other functions, but we're really concerned, we're really interested in ion balance and fluid balance. So taking a closer look at the kidneys, I swear the sensitivity of this microphone has really picked up in the past few days. Taking a closer look at the kidneys, you see the, um, on the right hand side of the body, this is an anterior view. Liver, large intestine, right kidney just tucked in under the 12th rib. And notice another large structure sitting right superior to the kidney, just superior to the kidney, the adrenal gland, the suprarenal gland. And I'm only pointing this out now because this comes into play when we talk about hormone release in that cascade of events. It helps to maintain blood pressure or regular blood pressure. The adrenal gland is integral in releasing some of those factors. Adrenal, suprarenal, because it sits literally on top of the kidney, the renal organ, like a hat. There's not a whole lot of interest here. You're, you're probably noticing the hilum is missing. You can see the artery and the vein going into the hilum. Uh, you know these structures, I think, fairly well from the lab. We're going to dive into some of the internal structures and spend time today on the functional unit. So internal structures. By now you've seen this a few times. You know that the gross organization of the internal structures is broken into uh, probably the cortex and the medulla. You can generally see some division. It's harder in the live samples to see such a clear-cut division between these two areas. But at least on the, uh, the cartoon diagram, we get this nice linear division between the outer cortex and the inner medulla. And the inner medulla is made up of a few pizza slices with intervening columns. The renal columns are the uh, columnar shaped cylinders between the pyramids, these angular or technically cone shaped features inside the kidney. All right, we only slice into two dimensions and they look like triangles and at the apex some stuff happens that we're interested in. But they're not only two dimensional, these are cone shaped pyramids. Now the pyramids collect, or are where, the functional units of the kidney converge. And we'll spend a lot of time on the nephrons in this series of slides. The nephron, one of them is highlighted here, but there are millions in the kidney, and these are the functional units that filter blood and create urine, ultimately collecting um, in the bladder. So fluids filtered here, urine starts to be produced in a trickle. It moves through the collecting duct and many nephrons will drain into one collecting duct. There's not only one collecting duct per, uh, per nephron. Multiple collecting ducts will drain into a papillary duct near the apex of the pyramid. And multiple papillary ducts will drain into a minor calyx or the minor calyces. The tips or the apexes of these pyramids. It's probably uh, difficult to see these in the real example in lab two weeks ago. We could see the major calyces quite well. If you look over on the right hand side, you can see those white structures. Um, here the dissection is a bit cleaner than we saw. We're not as technically inclined as the individuals that made these dissections. But uh, I know a few students in uh, the Monday afternoon lab were poking and prodding. You can see the calyces emerge from the, the apex of the pyramids. This is where the urine collects, eventually drains, 
into the renal pelvis before leaving the kidney proper. <coughs> Collecting in the ureters and then eventually making its way to be stored in the bladder before it's expelled. So really consider in this section, I'm not, uh, I'm not adding new information, but really start to consider the orientation of these structures. An oversized nephron highlighted in the pyramids, multiple nephrons drain into a collecting duct, multiple collecting ducts into a papillary duct, and it's a three-dimensional pyramid all funneling down to one main point. Now I'm going to keep a very similar line on blood flow as we saw in lab. We're going to cut out a lot of the, the middlemen, the branches of the renal artery coming in, the bifurcations. They're just smaller bifurcations that radiate outwards, and I'm not going to require you to know those, uh, just like in lab, because for all intents and purposes, the divisions are really what's important, and when we get down to that fine level, the immediate level of blood supply to the nephron, that's where we really start to care. That's where we really start to care. And so the few branches in the middle are things you've seen already, again, but should know moving forward. We'll refer to these structures a fair bit as we talk about passage of fluid and solutes from the blood into the nephron, which is really out of the body, and then being reabsorbed back into the venous uh, the venous side, you know, the venous blood. So these structures you can see all highlighted. If we zoom in again on the, uh, on the candidate functional unit of the kidney, the nephron, the afferent or afferent arterioles. Remember, we've seen these prefixes before with nerves, right? The neurons, afferent nerves were the ones that uh, conveyed sensory information. They ran away from the tissue. They arrived at the brain with sensory information. Here the afferent arterioles arrive at the nephron with incoming blood supply. Afferent arrives. This knotted structure, which you know to be the glomerulus. After the glomerulus, it's still arterial blood. It's slightly different because something happens at the glomerulus. But the efferent arterioles uh, are what take blood away from this structure. On the nervous side, we saw the efferent nerves were those that executed a task. They leave the brain, efferent. And as lame as that was, you'll remember, E leaves. Efferent arterioles leave the glomerulus and they divide and bifurcate to form this capillary network that surrounds the nephron. And for the most part, we refer to that capillary network as the paratubular capillaries, but there are some longer loops that are still capillaries that surround the, uh, the loop of the nephron, and we call those basorecta. The paratubular capillaries and the basorecta have similar roles in the exchange of substances, either absorption or secretion, but they both act in the exchange of substances. They're both capillaries. Now, of course, those... Oh. Of course, those converge into the unlabeled blue diagram here, which are the paratubular venules. And then we have convergence of multiple different venules until eventually we reach the renal veins. And then blood returns through the inferior vena cava back to the heart. So you can imagine the circuit of blood. It's very direct from the aorta to the renal artery through this series of divisions that we just talked about and then back to the heart. So the orientation is what I'm reminding you of right now. The intimate orientation of the nephron tubules, the yellow portions, and then the blood 
uh, supply in the body. They are not one and the same, but they are closely related. And it's that close relation that allows substances to move back and forth. And we're spending a lot of time in this section talking about that movement back and forth. So having this orientation in mind is important. Now let's dive briefly into the nephrons. I'm going to differentiate two different types of nephrons and we're going to end with a video that is fairly detailed but that we will return to and then explore in depth over our classes uh, next week, uh, Tuesday and Thursday. So the nephron is isolated here. The nephron is the corpuscle and the tubule. This is the nephron. Corpuscle and the nephron tubule. It is not the arterial or venous, the arterial supply or the venous drainage. It's not the blood supply. The nephron is the corpuscle and the tubule. It is intimately related to, it's closely associated with the arterial blood supply. And, it's, and that close association is integral to its function, its proper function as a nephron. But the nephron is isolated here. So the corpuscle and the nephron tubule. The corpuscle is the point of interaction between, or the first point of interaction between the arterial blood supply and the nephron. And you know these knotted structures from seeing them in lab. The corpuscle contains on the arterial side the glomerulus, these twisted, turning uh, arterial tubes that are in close association with the capsule, the, the glomerular capsule otherwise known as the Bowman's capsule. And this is where we have the initial exchange of fluids and some substances from the blood into the nephron. I'll also propose here, it's worth starting to think about this in a slightly different way. So far when we've been thinking about blood vessels or nerves, when it's been the focus of our attention, we are in that structure. And thinking about in versus out can be a bit confusing in this sense because if we're considering the nephron and we're looking at the Bowman's capsule or we're, we're considering the tubule, if we're in that structure, we're not actually in the body. And Matt did a good job of trying to differentiate and, um, to, uh, to relay that information to you in lab. If you're in the nephron, you're not actually in the body. This is uh, a place where, if anything remains, will be excreted from the body. It's essentially outside. It's not unlike the movement of the digestive system. It's not internal to the body. So thinking of being in the nephron, being in the nephron tubule as being outside of the body, I think is important as we start to talk about absorption and excretion, or absorption and secretion, rather. In the tubule portion of the nephron, there are three major divisions that combine and drain into a fourth. So the proximal tubule is so named because it's the closest portion to the glomerulus, the proximal convoluted tubule, and convoluted simply means it's got a coiled shape. It's twisted and turned and coiled. The proximal convoluted tubule you see up there on the top right hand side. Where it takes its final turn, the book says downwards, but it depends on where you are in the kidney, which direction down is. So I'll say deeper, when it dives deeper into the kidney less superficial. We see the nephron loop. There is a sharp drop shown here, a quick hairpin turn. This structure is the nephron loop. It's rather straight except for that one hairpin turn. And then the distal convoluted tubule, so named because it is further away 
from the glomerulus. Also twisted and coiled, easy piece, proximal versus distal, with the intervening nephron loop that connects those two coiled portions of the duct. Now, each nephron has those three characteristic parts of the tubule. Not each nephron has a collecting duct. One collecting duct is shared by many nephrons, but the distal convoluted tubule will drain into a collecting duct, and then onwards, we'll talk about where it goes afterwards. Now, a brief mention on types of nephrons, and it will be brief because the video that I want to look at is a little bit longer. It's about eight, nine minutes. So to make sure that we have time to get through it, a brief mention on two types of nephrons is not to scare you away into thinking that you have to memorize different structures and different functions. They both do very similar jobs. They're shaped slightly differently, and that shape underpins a slightly different function. But all of the same features that we just talked about are evident here. Cortical nephrons are by far the most prevalent. The large majority of nephrons in the kidney are cortical nephrons. And if we followed our blood flow through from the, uh, the immediate entry of blood into um, the space here with the afferent arterial, through the glomerulus, this is where fluid and some solutes or ions are filtered out through the capsule. And while that fluid is filtered out, the blood continues onwards to the efferent arterioles, leaving the capsule. And then entering that large capillary network. Here, the, the paratubular capillaries are uh, this massive coiled bird's nest of blood supply. And while blood is traveling through those paratubular capillaries, the fluid that was filtered out, or the fluid that was expelled briefly, travels through the proximal convoluted tubule after leaving the uh, glomerular capsule. To the nephron loop, the descending loop, through the hairpin turn to the ascending loop, and then back to the distal convoluted tubule in the same order that we just mentioned. In the same order, same linear series of events in this as in the other type of nephron. Now eventually you can see the collecting duct here. Notice the, the, the openings where other distal convoluted tubules would drain into this one common collecting duct. And then notice where multiple uh, collecting ducts would drain into a papillary duct, even deeper within the, uh, the renal pyramid. And then after draining to the papilla, in the minor calyx, urine emerges and is collected in the renal pelvis. So again, this is not new. What's new is the cortical nephron sits more superficial within the kidney. The loop is somewhat short in this diagram. Fluid and blood all pass through the same structures in the same order. The same functions are observed. It's the shape that's a little bit different. It's a little smaller than the nephron that I'll show you on the next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through in large detail the juxta uh, medullary nephrons. But these ones you'll notice sit deeper within the cortex. They extend deeper within the pyramid. The loop, the nephron loop is much longer. And this small difference in structure gives these nephrons the added function of being able to really concentrate, really affect the concentration of the urine that's expelled. We don't know why that's the case yet. We don't know why having this longer nephron loop will give us the ability to manipulate the concentration of urine. But we're going to find that out as we explore the physiology 
of the kidneys and the, uh, the reabsorption and secretion of ions and fluids in this system. Much larger uh, nephron loop that allows for much greater control <coughs> over the concentration of urine. So we're going to preface the next section which dives into the mechanisms behind urine formation and what is concentrated, what is dilute with this video, which is admittedly, um, it covers a lot of concepts, we'll put it that way. The primary function of the urinary system is to maintain the concentration of the blood plasma and fluid surrounding each cell. Waste excess solutes and water are removed by the kidneys and transported through ureters to the urinary bladder, where they remain until released from the body through the urethra. The nephron, the functional unit of the kidney, is a U-shaped microscopic tube that begins at the renal corpuscle, where blood interfaces with the renal tubule and ends by draining into a collecting duct. Between the tubular nephron and its blood vessels, three functions occur. Glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. I'm going to pause briefly a couple times through the video to make sure that the concepts make sense. Consider the directions of the arrows. Secretion here is substances entering the nephron tubule. Reabsorption previously were substances leaving the nephron tubule. So have or make sure that you're oriented properly. Glomerular filtration is the passing of filtrate through the glomerular capillaries into the glomerular capsule. The walls of the glomerular capillaries are filled with small pores called fenestrations. Fenestrations are surrounded by negative charges that repel passage of negatively charged proteins. Pyrocytes. Octopus-like cells with processes that wrap around the glomerular capillaries form filtration slits. Plasma and solutes, excluding most proteins, pass into the glomerular capsule through these openings. The glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, is the speed at which filtrate passes through the glomerular capillaries into the glomerular capsule. GFR is controlled by a process called renal autoregulation and contributes to maintenance of plasma concentration and removal of waste. If the GFR is too slow, too much is reabsorbed and plasma becomes too concentrated. Excessively high GFR doesn't allow time to reabsorb sufficient solutes back into the bloodstream. So consider that fast versus slow. If the filtering rate is too slow, not enough solute is initially expelled. Okay, the blood keeps all of that solute because it's not filtered out and it becomes too concentrated. If the filtering rate is too quick, too much leaves the blood and it becomes too dilute. Controlling GFR is a major concern. It's, it's what we try to regulate by modifying blood pressure and affecting some of the hormone release that we'll talk about coming up. A constant GFR requires a stable glomerular pressure. The myogenic mechanism contributes to this stability. When increased blood pressure causes renal arteriolar smooth muscle to stretch, automatic constriction of this smooth muscle will result because of this mechanism. When systemic blood pressure is low, the same muscle relaxes to maintain a constant GFR. 
GFR can also be adjusted by two to below glomerular feedback. Within the wall of the distal convoluted tubule is the macula densa. These cells detect the flow of filtrate through the nephron by monitoring sodium and chloride ions and water passing by. The cells secrete paracrines to adjust the diameter of the afferent material and control glomerular pressure. If the flow is too slow, the afferent arterial relaxes, increasing pressure in the glomerulus and increasing GFR and flow through the nephron. When a filtrate from the renal corpuscle flows into the proximal convoluted tubule, tubular reabsorption separates the needed concentrations of substances from their excess and from metabolic waste. Unneeded substances pass out of the body in the urine. Tubular reabsorption. The return of most water and filtered solutes to the bloodstream involves both passive and active processes. Urea and most ions passively diffuse from a proximal convoluted tubule into the interstitial fluid, then onto the peritubular capillaries. The reabsorption of other solutes requires energy-consuming primary or secondary active transport. Primary active transport uses energy derived from the hydrolysis of ATP to drive pumps which transport <coughs> substances against their concentration gradient. Secondary active transport uses the energy stored in an ion's electromechanical gradient instead of ATP. As one substance, such as sodium ions, moves down its concentration gradient, it pushes another substance against its gradient. Symporters move two or more substances in the same direction across the membrane. Antiporters move two or more substances in opposite directions across the membrane. Osmosis passively draws water out of the proximal convoluted tubule and descending limb of the nephron loop into the peritubular capillaries. The ascending limb of the nephron loop is impermeable to water, but actively pumps sodium and chloride ions into the interstitial fluid. The resulting buildup of salt surrounding the nephron loop draws about 80% of the water from the descending limb into the interstitial fluid and into the capillaries regularly fluid volume and osmolarity. This process of water following the solutes is known as obligatory water reabsorption. Some nephron loops extend deeply into the renal pyramids, allowing a process known as countercurrent multiplication to take place. Countercurrent multiplication forms and maintains a vertical osmotic gradient which allows additional water to be reabsorbed from the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. This controls plasma osmotic pressure and concentrates urine. Hormonal control of the water retention also occurs in the nephron. Extracellular osmotic pressure is regulated by the presence or absence of antidiuretic hormone, ADH. When the blood plasma becomes too concentrated, release of ADH signals the formation of water channels in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct allowing the kidneys to reabsorb additional water back into the bloodstream. When ADH is not present, excess water is excreted from the body as dilute urine. Blood pressure and volume are also affected by the kidneys. If receptors in the afferent arterial sense that blood pressure is low, the juxtaglomerular apparatus releases an enzymatic hormone called renin. The lungs respond to the release of renin by producing an activating enzyme, which results in formation of angiotensin II in the bloodstream. Angiotensin II causes blood vessels to constrict, increasing blood pressure, and stimulates the adrenal glands to release the hormone aldosterone, which also causes an increase in plasma volume and consequent blood pressure. Aldosterone causes greater plasma volume 
because it increases active transport of sodium and chloride ions into the interstitial fluid. Combined with the production of ADH, the additional reabsorption of sodium and chloride ions causes more water to be drawn into the bloodstream by osmosis, resulting in increase in blood volume. Tubular secretion is the transfer of materials from the peritubular capillaries and tubular cells into the tubular fluid for excretion as urine. Hydrogen and potassium ions, as well as other chemicals, drugs, and food additives that need to be removed from the body are transported from the peritubular capillaries into the renal tubule and secreted into the urine. The major functions of the nephron will merit the filtration tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion enable your kidneys to maintain solutes and water concentrations, assist in the regulation of blood pressure and blood volume, and remove excess substances and waste from your body. Okay, a lot of topics. That's the roadmap for the rest of our slides. So there are things that you shouldn't know right now that might be confusing. But, uh, never mind. but uh, we're following the flow of that information as we go through the rest of the section. Three main physiological mechanisms, ion absorption, ion secretion, or fluid secretion. We'll come back and see uh, more on Tuesday.